now going to have a, a panel, an interactive panel on issues of racial equality. As we've already seen, um, there are many issues that ethnic minorities face across the Asia Pacific and in Hong Kong. Um, issues of poverty, education, uh, the treatment of in particular um, migrant workers and women who are also ethnic minorities, those intersectional issues are all very important. This panel will explore those issues more. First of all, I'd like to introduce to you our moderator, who is uh, Dr. Rizwan Ula. I was thinking there are more doctors at this conference than in most hospitals. Um, obviously not the same doctors. Uh, he is the head of publicity and information technology division of the Delia Memorial School uh, in Hong Kong. And he's also the deputy convener of the Policy Research and Training Committee of the EOC. And he's also one of our EOC board members. Um, but he is particularly suited to this uh, discussion because he has over 15 years of experience in teaching, um, including, most importantly, non-ethnic Chinese people in Hong Kong. And as uh, Stephen Fisher said, that is a major barrier for ethnic minorities learning Chinese. So uh, with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Rizwan to the floor. This session is expected to uh, focus on the uh, barriers faced by the uh, ethnic minorities. And here, like uh, for people who stays in Hong Kong, you might try to figure out like why we are bringing in uh, migrant workers, and then education and poverty, these three things together. So maybe we can look at this in a way like this. We are going to look at ethnic minorities. There are two, two groups, subgroups. One are the uh, foreign domestic helpers, migrant workers, and the other are the ethnic minorities. And then we'll look at education and poverty, how that is affecting them. So before I get into all these nitty gritty details, I want to introduce the heavyweights. Uh, sitting next to me. So each of them have their spe specialization, either uh, because they work in groups that work with NGOs or countries that they represent. And this session will be aimed at sharing the experiences and the cross-learning opportunities they may provide. So later, they will focus on the progress and development that have helped them to serve their communities and overcome barriers. And the title of this uh, talk later will be barriers to ethnic minorities in focus. And as Peter has mentioned earlier, it's an interactive session. So please try to record the input you had from the three speakers earlier and later from the heavyweights. And do ask questions uh, towards the end. There'll be 15 minutes, so start writing down your question or get a question later. We don't want to make it only among us. It's interactive, so all of us. So let me just quickly go through uh, the heavyweights that we have. So I'll start from uh, the far end there. So uh, it's Ms. Phyllis Cheng. She uh, is actually the executive director of Hong Kong Unison, a local NGO that upholds racial equality and the rights of ethnic minority residents in Hong Kong. So she leads Unison, for example, calling for the amendments to the race discrimination ordinance, as well as for inclusive and equitable uh, education opportunities for ethnic minority students. Now, Unison regularly meets with the government officials and lawmakers to advocate policy changes for the betterment of ethnic minorities. And she actually recently returned with her team from Geneva after attending the uh, 90, uh, 96th session of the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And then I would like to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Uh, well, please give a big round of applause to uh, Mr. Phyllis Chang. Yes, yeah. Okay, we need. To, okay, then Mr. Ahmed Damanik. So uh, he is the chairperson of the National Commission on Human Rights of Indonesia and lecturer at the uh, Department of Politics, Faculty of Social and Political Sciences in North Samutera University. He has substantial experience in human rights and child rights issues. Now, he was the chair of ethical board of election committee of North Sumatra in 2009 and has been working for the advancement of children's rights since 1986 when he established uh, Yayasan KKSP, the Center for Child Rights and Education, which specializes in uh, addressing issues such as child labor and education. 
So a big round of applause to uh, Mr. Domanek. And then, moving on, Ms. Kay McArdle. So, uh, is the, uh, the first CEO of the Pathfinders, which was uh, established in October 2003. Now, Pathfinders is a Hong Kong charity that works to help pregnant migrant working women and their children. So it does this by providing humanitarian assistance, such as food, clothing, shelter, and much more like counseling, education, healthcare, and legal services. Now, Kay is actually responsible for Pathfinder strategic development with particular focus on government, consular, academic, and interagency relations and law and policy work. Now, a Hong Kong and UK qualified lawyer and mediator by background. So Kay previously worked at uh, Mayor Brown, JSM, Goldman Sachs, and Masons. And a big round of applause to this Kay. And last but not least, we have uh, Mr. Ashwin Raj. So it will not be complete if we don't have a, uh, Asia Pacific. So uh, Mr. As, uh, Ashwin Raj is from Fiji and uh, he is the director of the Human Rights and Anti-Discrimination Commission of Fiji and the chairperson of the Media Industry Development Authority. So please, a big round of applause to uh, Mr. Ashwin. Now, so we will go through some questions and we will be interacting. And I would encourage all the guests to start scribbling your question. And we only have 45 minutes for discussion, so later I hope I have to do my job. And then we'll try to get their Q&A and answer some of the things that has not been answered or that you wish to share. So to start with, now, in any order, may I ask each of you to give a very quick overview of the work you do with respect to migrants and racial minorities in each of your respective countries or areas of work. So, the floor is yours now. So maybe, well, let's not be students in a classroom, okay? So maybe we start with Phyllis first. Hello, I'll start first. So I'm Phyllis of um, Hong Kong Unison. Um, as Riz, um, Dr. Riz already um, explained, uh, we work for uh, equality for ethnic minority residents in Hong Kong. Why I stress residents? Because he also mentioned that um, there are different groups of um, uh, non-ethnic Chinese people in Hong Kong, namely um, the residents who have been here um, second or uh, three, two or three generations already, and then there are asylum seekers and refugees who have actually not a resident status in Hong Kong, and um, as well as the uh, foreign, the migrant domestic workers, whom um, Dr. Pujo Kapai has already mentioned, most of them are Filipinos and Indonesians, so they are also non-ethnic Chinese. Um, so our work mainly focused on um, policy change, um, advocating the government to provide an equitable education. Um, everyone gets education here in Hong Kong. Um, we have 12 years of um, free education and nine, nine years of compulsory education. But um, those of you who came here yesterday also heard um, Dr. Um, Professor Cheung, um, who was the first chair of the Equal Opp Opportunities Commission, um, we're talking about substantive equality. And in the very first um, talk uh, with Dr. Stephen Fisher this morning, he also mentioned about the, um, the gaps in the education system, which is uh, not treating really um, ethnic minorities uh, equally. So my work is more focused on education issues because that's a root cause of the many problems that um, ethnic minorities face uh, here currently in Hong Kong, and um, also uh, the race uh, discrimination ordinance amendments. So um, these are our, our major focus of work. So we'll come back to you later uh, more on the uh, education and the uh, race discrimination ordinance, if we have time for that. Okay. Maybe, how about Mr. Ahmed? Uh, th thank you very much, uh, this one, as moderator, uh, give me a chance to speak. Uh, our commission is an uh, independent state institution on human rights. Uh, this is the 25th year of establishment of uh, commissions under a regime of uh, authoritarian Suharto, but after that uh, reviewed by national law on human rights. So there are four national law mandated to us. One is uh, human rights uh, national law, law of human rights code. Uh, it is uh, related to the uh, gross violation of human rights, like genocides, human, uh, 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 crimes against humanity, and others. 
And uh, the third is the national law on eradication of discrimination based on racial and ethnic. Uh, and uh, the last one is protect, uh, the national law on protection of social conflict. Uh, for, for, by this uh, four national law, we have a duty to, to, to do pro-justicia investigation for gross violation of human rights, especially. And then to do monitoring, study, education, or mediation, etc., to another uh, case of uh, uh, human rights violations. We have seven commissioners with 350 staff. Next year, we will have another uh, additional 150 staff, so we'll around 500. And six branch offices, because uh, Indonesia is a very big country, so, uh, with uh, 17,000 17, of island, 260. Uh, one million of people. Uh, so we also have a special uh, team here to handle the issue of uh, minority. But in this uh, forum, uh, moderator invited me to discuss more on uh, migrant workers, where Indonesia has sent in uh, around 9 million, according to the World Bank data. But according to NATO data, less than the 9 million. But of course, millions of uh, people of Indonesia. Majority are female and uneducated, unskilled labor. So they are working in, uh, mostly in uh, Malaysia and also in Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, around 1.5 million uh, people. Less than one, 1 million is registered. So around five to 600 are unregistered. Uh, of, of course, they, are, they have so many uh, uh, legal uh, problems there. In Malaysia, it's around uh, uh, 5 million people. Yeah? And According to the Consulate General of Indonesia in Hong Kong, in Hong Kong there are around 170,000 uh, of Indonesians, mostly women, working as uh, domestic workers, uh, as maid, or working in, in store and something. Yeah. Maybe, uh, Mr. Ahmed, we'll come back to you on, we have some specific numbers, we will come back to you Thank later you. on that questions. Maybe, uh, how about Kay? Thanks, Riz. Um, so I work at Pathfinders, and we look after children born to migrant workers um, here in Hong Kong. So the problem these children have is that um, largely the fathers, who are largely uh, between 80 and 90 percent every year, they're, they're men in Hong Kong, the biological fathers fall out of the picture, and the baby is then left um, with its mother, um, generally derided, uh, not very welcomed, and largely despised within a context of extreme poverty. The work we do is to ensure that this predominantly stateless group of children is protected, and we do that by helping their mums. The mums typically are migrant domestic workers. They can also be hotel workers. We are a receiving nation of significant amounts of labor supply from the Asia Pacific region, predominantly um, Indonesians and Filipinos, um, predominantly female, predominantly of childbearing age, and for reasons I am yet to understand, we do not have any guidance as to what a healthy, happy, well-managed pregnancy and birth should look like in this context. So the headline is that we provide humanitarian supplies and support, we have a small shelter, we also um, work on the policy um, and advocacy side, both at United Nations, but also at local legislative level. Um, we're working on the, the regional focus and have made some inroads there. Um, our numbers, just to wrap up, um, are that we've helped um, 6,000 people and we're about 10 years old. Thank you. Thank you, okay. How about uh, Ashwin? Um, thank you for having me this morning. There's a fundamental reason why the National Human Rights Institution is called the Human Rights and Anti-Discrimination Commission because it is a response to a particular historical political conjuncture we find ourselves in precisely because Fiji, like other countries that are structured by settler colonialism, is marked by this fractal politics around ethnic relations. We've had four, constitution, uh, four coups and four constitutions to undo this historical derailment of colonialism. And one of the problems is that with the primacy of race, you know, pretty much characterized by the false binary between ethnic accommodation and accumulation, we've actually forgotten the ways in which they're actually dialectically linked in terms of inequality and the ways in which inequality manifests itself along ethnic lines. But what it has also done is that the primacy over ethnicity in terms of understanding citizenship, in terms of understanding belongingness, 
and coupled by a long history of affirmative action, and Fiji is emerging out of the detritus of institutionalized racism, it has thoroughly imperiled the ability of ordinary Fijians to think through the plight of others beyond the binary of settlers and indigenous. So we in, a, in, in, in this country struggle very hard to think through and imagine and enter the protocols of the plight of, of, of migrant workers, of asylum seekers, and so on and so forth. And there's this looming specter of yet another ethnicity sort of coming in and trying to complicate our political scene. And I think one of the things that we, and I'm gonna close here, and hopefully there'll be conditions, possibility for larger sort of you know, discussion around it, the ways in which the primacy of ethnicity then imperils our ability to think through principles of non-discrimination that would apply to all. So just uh, to, elab uh, to extend on what Ashwin has just mentioned, well, obviously uh, today we only have a very short time and uh, I believe today is just the beginning and uh, we hope later when we have identified some of the barriers or something that we have shared, towards the end we can come up with some uh, food for thought, like some solutions that we can uh, take Take us uh, take together with us, and then we can have further discussion on that. And I would uh, encourage the members in the audience also to, if you have any thoughts, you can share it with us uh, at the end. So, well, to begin with, now uh, we can first look at the uh, migrant workers first. Now, uh, like Pooja uh, in her presentation. Earlier, she mentioned she did an intersectional analysis and also did some elaboration on um, the migrant workers in Hong Kong, like in particular the domestic helpers, uh, about the living room, can't get right of a boat and can't change jobs and lists of things that they they have. Now, Kay, can you actually tell us a little more on the cases uh, that you are looking at? Like, what are the problems? that these victims face? It's quite a long list, actually. Why don't I walk you through a bit of a story? So the classic case at Pathfinders, and these are, by definition, they become complex in different aspects. But I'll just give you a basic rundown um, in, in short um, step, if I may. So uh, a migrant worker is employed as a foreign domestic worker, which is under a specific contract form she is subject to a very special set of um, minimum wages that apply to her. They don't apply to anyone else in Hong Kong, but they apply to her. Um, she works. She's entitled at law to maternity protection. But if she becomes pregnant, the majority of our cases see that she is fired because she's pregnant, which is terrible in so many respects. And uh, what happens in terms of humanity and loss of dignity is you then begin this cycle of precarity, which is quite unimaginable when you sit, as I do, in the benefit, uh, for most of my life, of air conditioning and so on. And uh, what happens is she immediately, because of the live-in rule attached to her contract terms, becomes homeless. So now you have a pregnant homeless woman. If the employer has, as is too often the case, or indeed the agent has retained her identity documentation, she is pregnant, and homeless and has no identity, no legal identity. Within two weeks, she loses access to all health care. There are no maternity checks going on. All those checks that most people get when they're pregnant, she loses. So she's now homeless, penniless, has no identity and no health care to support her. The child is then born, quite often with no support at all. And generally at this point, no one's congratulated her on her pregnancy, no one is offering support. She is entirely alone. Where's she living? She's living in one of the old um, refugee places in Hong Kong, we have many, or in one of the former um, farms, uh, the chicken or the pig farms in the new territories, which are extremely basic housing, extremely basic, I can't emphasize that enough, with open sewage and so on. The child is then born. If there are difficulties with the child or the child is born prematurely, there is nowhere uh, or no one um, she can approach or ask for help from. And even if she could, she doesn't know, because she's not from here, that she could dial 999 and ask for help. We had a, a, an exact case like this uh, two weeks ago where the woman actually miscarried early and went to the hospital. And the first thing that happened was not to see how she was doing, 
but they called the police, suspecting an illegal abortion. And that case was just heartbreaking. I can talk about that later, but let me continue with a normal, a normal case. So the man is not in the picture because the man, the biological father, is in fact her husband in Indonesia. And, um, and so what happens in these cases is the child then arrives and is born without medical support, without an identity. And then what happens is the woman is arrested for being an immigration overstayer. And that is how you know that there is a significant injustice here because this woman is ultimately the victim of a crime. Under the laws which do exist, both the employment <coughs> ordinance and our sex discrimination ordinance, about which we've heard a great deal, provide that terminating a woman's employment when pregnant is a criminal <coughs> offence. And yet she, as a result of that, ends up as the immigration overstayer, as the criminal herself. And a more destitute or easier to prey on victim you really could not find than a homeless, penniless, identityless mother and newborn child. And that's where the precarity kicks off anew. Abuse, neglect, trafficking. So that's generally what we're looking at. And our interventions range obviously from counselling and care and support and just tea and biscuits quite often, right through to food and clothing. Um, access to healthcare, um, legal support, the full range, because this group has fallen and is crashing through Hong Kong's social welfare safety net. And we know this group will go up from 380,000, which is the current number, um, to what the government announced in March this year, to 600,000. And there is no um, solution in sight apart from us. And we are very, very small and unsupported. For case this one, I will come to you about this 600,000 in 200, sorry, in 2047. This number, I'll come to you in a bit. Maybe, Mr. Ahmed, now, as a sending nation, now, what are the most critical issues like migrant workers face? Now, there was a report from World Bank, which you also highlighted. You, there's some disagreement with the numbers, but we can actually, inside the report, like they mentioned, uh, the, the title of the report was Indonesia's Global Workers, Juggling Opportunities and Risks. Like it notes that it is important for Indonesian authorities to reform its labor migration system to allow those Indonesians who want to work abroad uh, access better paid jobs while their protection can be improved. Now, what barriers exist and has their plight been hurt? Uh, thank you. Uh of course, we agree that according to data uh, mentioned by uh, World Bank, yeah, uh, our micro workers so, uh, send a big money to Indonesia as a revenue of uh, our our income. But we still have many uh, some some serious uh, critical issues. I mean, one is about trafficking issues, especially migrant workers from Indonesia to Malaysia, because there are hard, uh, there are thousands checkpoints that uh, Indonesian can can go to can enter Malaysia very easy. Yeah. Of course, another issue is about data, data manipulation. There are many children under 18 changing their data, their data, and also the name, also the, the age, and then sending by the agent to other countries. Corruption also in immigration, police, not only in Indonesia side, but also to a receiving country like Malaysia. That's why there are thousand people from Indonesia can go easily or can enter easily to Malaysia so because of uh, uh, mutual uh, 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 corruption between Malaysians and also Indonesians uh, officer smuggling of people and another data said that uh, every year there are 1500 people died in from Malaysia is around 1000 Another hundred is in Middle East, especially in Saudi Arab Arabia, because of sick, because of injured, working. I mean, working uh, incident, and also uh, other other uh, uh, problem. Uh, some migrant workers also involved in various serious crimes, such as drug trafficking, killing people, as well as uh, regular crimes like stealing, violence, sexual abuse. But some space. Sp some cases in, in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, women uh, get penalized that penalty, not because of their ki they, they, they kill, but because of the, they, they are raped by uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the men. And after that, of course, 
he def she defend the uh, their side. But uh, we have a problem on uh, 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 leg legal legal system. Uh, we have to respect internal legal mechanism or legal system in in that country. We cannot interfere. So one approach that we can we can do as the Indonesian uh, side is to approach them to give the uh, uh, mercy. Mer mercy mechanism is uh, applied in in. in in, in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. So we have also a bilateral agreement with Malaysia. And now we, we will sign a, a MOU between Indonesia, Commission of Human Rights, SUHAKAM, so Malaysian Commission of Human Rights, and Philippines Human Rights Commission in order to handle, to focus on a stateless person also which is around 100,000 people in Sabah only, yeah? in Sabah only. Uh, maybe in other, other provinces or uh, other places in Malaysia is more than uh, that, because Sabah is uh, uh, a small uh, 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 state of uh, Malaysia in Kalimantan or in Borneo Island. Another issue is about the implementation of uh, uh, judicial or, uh, regu regulation. We have so many regulations. We are we have ratified international instrument, international international standard on, on migrant workers, on labors. We have ratified so many international conventions also. We have a new law to protect our migrant workers. But we still have a lack of implementation uh, on that good regulation. Sometimes it's because of corruption, sometimes it's because of political will mm. is so weak from the government. Even though the government has set up since uh, some years ago a special body for protecting and preventing uh, or helping uh, our migrant workers. This is a big special body in Indonesia. We call it the BNP 2 TKI. Yeah? Okay, thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Ahmed. So uh, you have talked about the, the legal system and the existing regulations, and you have highlighted about the injustice that the, the workers face, and also the implementation of the regulation is a little weak because of corruption and some yeah. uh, glitches in the system. Now, uh, okay, I'd like you to uh, highlight briefly, very briefly, like you just talk about the number, like 600,000, like in Hong Kong, we expected this number to shoot up to 600,000 in 2047. Uh, to cater for the aging population. Now, what potential barriers or problems would you speculate to arise? This might be a long list as well. I'll try and be brief. We, we can keep um, it, yeah. So the issues are that the aging population isn't just a linear construct. As we increase our aging population, we see higher incidences of Alzheimer's. So it's not just your regular elderly care, it is specialized elderly care. And the contracts currently being used to employ uh, migrant workers to fill this carer gap are not designed, and nor is there training in advance of them arriving to cope with that specialized care. My, my father has Alzheimer's, and so I have a degree, not a specialized degree, but certainly a degree of understanding as to how much care is required and the burden this puts on any employee, let alone a family member. So within all of that, this, this huge increase and the fact we're being given time to prepare for it, when uh, Matthew Jung um, in the Hong Kong government announced this, this huge number earlier this year, we obviously at Pathfinders were really quite concerned about how we're going to cope with this massive increase in cases because the cases will increase. So the issues are around, are we using our time well to plan for what we know is coming? And that is where I think we are. In fact, yes, there could be problems, but we actually should be focusing on the opportunity to prepare for that eventuality. People in Hong Kong live a long time. Yeah. Our aging population is going to happen. It's not a, it's not a variable, it's going to happen. Right. So what can we do to prepare? And I'd really like to see um, cross-party and cross-sector conversations going on with an open mind to protect our elderly because they are a very precious thing that we have globally but in Hong Kong and we should be harnessing them, not putting them in a position where they don't have a say in their future. Right, thank you. So I think you uh, mentioned one very important word. It's how to embrace 
this uh, like embrace uh, this opportunity and how to get well prepared and there might be a lot of implications on both like receiving and then sending and as well but anyway uh, well actually I've uh, kept two of our panelists quiet and I think it would be fair to hear from them as well so maybe uh, Phyllis uh, now when we look at uh, success like one key factor is education and uh, this is an issue for ethnic minorities uh, in Hong Kong like obviously, uh, I was born and raised in Hong Kong. I know how it's like being an EM. And uh, from your angle, uh, can you please share with us, uh, like, like earlier you also talk about the education, like it must be a substantive uh, education. So what is your understanding and definition of an equitable education for the ethnic minorities in Hong Kong. Thank you, Dr. Riz. Um, an equitable education, I think Dr. Uh, Stephen Fisher in his earlier um, speech presentation already spoke about the differences in, in the system for ethnic minority children before and after 1997 and how um, the education system in Hong Kong after 97 it's based on a, <clears throat> a mother tongue um, language policy. Mother tongue language policy meaning um, most schools should uh, use um, Chinese as a teaching medium, as an, uh, a medium of instruction. So that, that creates a huge barrier to ethnic minority students. But what Hong Kong Unison sees is um, there is a systematic problem and it's all about policy. For example, um, the, the, the um, Education Bureau has, hasn't really rolled out any policies um, in terms of setting up curriculum or a language policy for um, non-ethnic Chinese children, the ethnic minority children. And this problem has been on for, I would say, more than 10 years. And we've spoken to um, the EOC as well as, as the only um, equality commission in Hong Kong. But again, um, I... You remember what doc, uh, Ms. Pooja Kapai was talking about, the gaps in the race discrimination ordinance, that government's powers and functions are not under the purview of the race discrimination ordinance. So uh, what about um, the education policies? So education policies is actually under government powers. So, um, and this is expressly excluded in the race discrimination ordinance. Um, Go back to some history. Actually, there are four discrimination ordinances in Hong Kong, and all of them include government powers and functions. And one of the um, very outstanding um, cases was the sexual discrimination or uh, the, the 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 case against the Education Bureau uh, with the sexual discrimination ordinance that I think Professor Zhang also mentioned yesterday about the uh, boys and girls ratio in a, in the public school system, but. We can't use that because um, the EOC cannot help us, unfortunately, because government powers is not under the purview of the RDO. So this is a very big problematic, uh, this is a big systematic problem that we face. And the other one is, um, I think Dr. Fisher also mentioned of a designated school. What it is, is before 97, there are many schools um, that would just accept ethnic minority students. Because for some reasons, um, the government feels that they won't be able to learn Chinese. So what do they learn? They learn English and they learn French. And what can you do with French in Hong Kong? So um, it's also under Hong Kong Unison that we have been pushing a lot. Why are they born in Hong Kong? Actually, a recent report shows that there are about 65% of the local um, ethnic minorities are born locally in Hong Kong. If they're born in Hong Kong, why are they not given the same kind of education? They have to go through all different subjects, but Chinese. Is this an unconscious bias on behalf of the government that they can't learn Chinese or a stereotype that they cannot learn Chinese? So there is a big problem here and the government has not been trying hard to desegregate a school. Um, language learning environment is very important and it starts at a young age. Um, both Hong Kong Unison and also the EOC has conducted surveys on discrimination at kindergarten age. So we're talking about discrimination at three years old. 
and we find there is discrimination. Kindergartens do not like accepting ethnic minority children, especially children from with a South Asian and also Southeast Asian background. So um, why, why is that? And the government is not really doing much to tackle this problem. And with the EOC, um, their, in, their power is very limited and limited scope of application as well. But um, if we, we were hoping that EOC could do more investigation. But again, because of the law, because of the way that the race discrimination is set up, the threshold of um, burden of proof is very high. So it's very hard to prove these kind of discrimination. So that, that just um, um, perpetuates in the whole education system. Maybe Ashwin, like after hearing what Phyllis has mentioned, and then to my limited understanding about the uh, uh, the affirmative action in uh, Fiji, can you share, uh, shed some light uh, on this with respect to the uh, uh, protection and all these things? Yes, yeah. Um, absolutely. Very quickly, I think when it comes to the question of ethnic minorities and barriers and all of that, it's absolutely important that we we uh, ensure that the conversations are you know contextually and historically sort of responsive, and the ways in which it actually plays out in different uh, spaces. Uh, in the case of Fiji, um, you know, even though we had an indigenous uh, community that is both demographically and pre politically preponderant. The, uh, the, the belief at that time was that the indigenous communities were not uh, at par with, with you know, uh, Indo-Fijians and Indians at that time, and now we're all Fijians under the new constitution, uh, on par in the realm of uh, economy and education, so on and so forth. So they actually went to Malaysia and bought the model of Bhumiputra which, uh, in fact, you know, uh, through the country in profound contradiction, given the fact that our indigenous community is already thriving demographically, politically preponderant, have 98% um, you know, control of land and so on and so forth. One of the, one of the imperils of you know, that kind of politics then is that when you move towards the principle of non-discrimination and common and equal citizenry, which is what our constitution allows now, the fundamental question of our times is, how do you evacuate race from the vicissitudes of racism? How do you think about the question of ethnicity and race as meaningful signifiers, so that you can res resuscitate certain rights without having it banalized as an institution of discrimination? So I, I think that's the fundamental question of our times. And you know, this is where uh, you know, the question around and the, and the paranoia and the anxiety around sort of minority discourse you know, comes into play, especially when it comes to issues of human trafficking, asylum seekers. We had one uh, asylum seeker in, in, in our country uh, last year, and he was an in, in Iranian. And you know, this person had just landed into the country, and already there was so much dis uh, discussion about you know, the Islamization of Fiji, and he happened to be a Christian, uh, you know, rampant, you know, uh, you know um, uh, criminalization, we're going to have refugee camps, so on and so forth. And, you know, it was mostly coming from Indo-Fijians. And I thought, these guys should be the last people talking about this stuff because they've been on the receiving end of discrimination. So this is why I think the conversation around non-discrimination needs to start sort of being a conversation about how we resuscitate some of these terms meaningfully, characteristically. And this is where I think the, the role of National Human Rights Commissions come in. Because for a lot of people, when there is a suspension of the economy of rights, precisely because they're in a state of precarity, this is where we come in. And I think, I think we've got a long way to go in terms of looking at the ways in which we can resuscitate uh, terms such as race and ethnicity as, as significant markers of difference, as signifiers that are positive for you know, leak, reclaiming of certain rights, the restitution of rights where there's been a suspension, but also to target racism and discrimination, which actually emanates from the very basis of identification. So that's the binary we're in. And I'm pretty sure Fiji is not a state of exception from the conversation I'm hearing. This seems to be, and again, how do you then talk about these things in a meaningful way so that it does not descend into racial and religious vilification. The fine line between free speech and hate speech. That's another big struggle for us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ashman. Now, uh, maybe uh, let me just share with you like the words 
that I've been hearing some of the recurring theme, like so far, like looking at the uh, migrant workers and the uh, ethnic minorities. Like one word that I'm hearing, like I heard a few times, is gaps, injustice, uh, slow implementation, and affirmative action.